Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Friday, everybody! Congratulations, we're at the end of the week once again. Just a heads up at the beginning of the episode: there may not be an episode of China Update tomorrow, Saturday.、Uh, there may be, there may not be. That isn't confirmed yet.、And、whatever happens, we will be back to regular episodes on Monday, nonetheless. Now, let's begin today's episode with our ongoing coverage of the slow-moving housing crisis. There are a few key developments that we need to cover. In a joint statement published yesterday, the People's Bank of China, China's central bank, and And the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission announced that local governments will be permitted to further relax mortgage loan requirements for first-home buyers. Qualified cities will be allowed to maintain, lower, or fully remove entirely mortgage rate floors for first-home buyers. This is just the latest policy support, of course, in a slew of stimulus policies, including down payment and mortgage rate reductions, which we have seen in recent months. According to Centerline Property Agency Limited, as of the end of August, Chinese authorities at the local and central level have rolled out more than 650 measures to support the housing market. In the same month, August, new home prices in China's top 70 cities dropped for the 12th consecutive month. Evidently, however, policymakers still feel more loosening is required to bolster the housing market, even at the risk of increasing financial instability. State media writes that the policy easing announced yesterday is intended to quote reduce borrowing costs to support demand in the housing market. End quote. And that is not all. Also yesterday, in a separate announcement, China's central bank vowed to expand the pilot lending program recently launched to ensure the delivery of delayed housing projects. We're not surprised by this news. Of course, we've been anticipating that this special lending program would cost much more than the initial government forecasts, thus necessitating an expansion of the program. The People's Bank of China expressed that it will quote roll out city-specific property policies to support demand, implement special loans dedicated to ensuring property completion, and increase their magnitude within reason. End quote. Analysts argue that missing Q3, Chinese leadership is seeking stabilization of the economy in Q4, especially in the housing sector. Quote, the fourth quarter is a critical time to make progress on construction resumption. If the macro economy stabilizes and supportive measures get implemented well, the housing sales slump this year may narrow to about 20 percent, in a sign of stabilization. End quote. Stabilization and finishing uncompleted apartments is one thing; restoring confidence in the broader housing market is quite another. And then dealing with the deep structural issues between land development and local fiscal conditions is an even bigger challenge. And this is where the crux of the housing crisis and China's true crisis. Really lies. Yesterday, we discussed the increasing involvement of local government financing vehicles in the land market to plug local government revenue. According to data compiled by analysts at brokerage GM Securities Co Limited, in the first quarter of 2022, local government financing vehicles accounted for 24.9 percent of total land sales, up from 9.2 percent in the first half of 2021. The fiscal pain from the double hit on both the expenditure and revenue side to local governments has. Has been very real. For example, in the southwestern megacity of Chongqing, population 40 million, in the first seven months of 2022, revenue for land use sales, which the government had budgeted for, plunged over 82 percent. This is devastating to short-term fiscal health, and we remember that expenses are higher due to zero COVID, as well as the drought and firefighting measures in Q3 in the megacity. So we need to keep this in mind as we think about these easing measures that we just discussed for local governments, which they are now permitted to take. What we will likely see is local actions that further entrench the very structural issues that Beijing needs to fix, and this is the true housing crisis. Quote, Chongqing is very anxious and asking around for companies to buy land parcels. If it cannot find developers to buy land, it will probably instruct local government financing vehicles to step in. This is how local governments and local government financing vehicles collude to suck money from the banks. 
end quote. Hey guys, if you enjoy China Update and you'd like to help me keep this channel sustainable, it's just me making these episodes every day. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. And if you like this episode in particular, don't forget to hit the like button. This is a big help as well. As always, thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. Next up, after a period of understatement this year, multiple signs suggest that controversial economic policy championed by Xi Jinping in 2020 and 21 common prosperity may be making a strong comeback as we move into what will likely be the General Secretary's third term after the upcoming 20th Party Congress. The recent announcement confirming the dates of the Party Congress stated that common prosperity would be a key agenda item at the historic event, though without providing further details. We're still not clear on what common prosperity even means in terms of practical policy measures. Is it primarily rhetorical with only modest income redistribution, or will it be much more disruptive to the already bruised private sector? Some commentators suspect something more towards the latter. Quote, Common prosperity has not gone away, as some suggested earlier this year, and I doubt it is going to be as benign, at least from the perspective of private enterprises and investors, as mainly just making the cake bigger. End quote. In Chinese political discourse, the notion of common prosperity dates back to the 1950s and Mao Zedong, and would be reinvented by Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s. She has now once again brought the phrase back. Because of this repeated use during different periods and the general ambiguity of the term, common prosperity can invoke different and even contradictory feelings when used in political discourse, depending on the speaker and the audience. This is similar to concepts like liberty, equality, civilization, or patriotism, to give a few examples, in Anglo-American political discourse. It is hoped that Beijing will deliver a clearer and more detailed description and plan for the concept during the upcoming party congress. A recent seminar discussing common prosperity could give us some clues, however, but still not too much clarity. Here are a few quotes from speakers at the event to give a taste of how policymakers are debating the strategy. Quote, a market economy or market mechanism cannot automatically solve the problem of social equity, and if the distribution system is not fair, the result is bound to be polarization, and it is impossible to move towards common prosperity even if the cake is made bigger. End quote. John continues by frankly acknowledging that, in addition to high growth rates in the last 40 years, China, quote, has also formed a realistic pattern of large income disparity and high Gini coefficient, which is, in fact, affecting the continuation of making a bigger cake, end quote, end quote, only when the distribution system becomes more and more just will it be able to continuously benefit all the people, end quote. Another speaker, Gao Peiyong, deputy head of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, softening the socialist language of Zhang somewhat and perhaps anticipating potential apprehension from some of the audience old enough to remember the horror and violence of the Mao era class wars, expressed, quote, In the process of promoting common prosperity, it is necessary to give full play to the role of high-income groups and entrepreneurs and encourage them to give back to the society. But by no means does this mean, now employing two Chinese expressions, robbing the rich to help the poor or smashing landlords to divide the land. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.